Hi, I'm Mandy Haynes with Well Read Magazine, and I'm very excited to introduce our April featured author, Carolyn Haynes. Y'all know how much I, y'all know how much I love her. She is a fantastic author with 80 plus published books under her belt. She has written in so many different genres from romantic mystery, Southern Gothic, literary fiction, crime novels, mystery, and what else? What else? Horror. Horror. Uh, nonfiction and short fiction. Oh, gosh. So you have a big following with your Sarah Booth Delaney mysteries. I think, are you on your 27th? 27, yes. Wow. Um, but you've got such a great story. Um, your whole writing life. I mean, and you've taught writing. Um, for, well, let's start, let's start with how you start your first published book. Um, I published a, a Harlequin Intrigue, a romantic mystery called A Deadly Breed when I was 34. And so that was uh, the beginning. And I have, I really do have to say that I learned so much about writing, working with the Harlequin editors who were top drawer. They were terrific editors. How many, how many books did you write with them? About 37, and 17 of them were about Familiar the Black Cat Detective. Wow, I forgot about Familiar. Well, Familiar is the forerunner to the most recent cat books that we did as a, an author collective about Trouble the Black Cat Detective, who is the son of Familiar. So oh. I'm on Good Fortune Farm Refuge, <laughs> Which is, um, I have a small farm in Alabama, in Sims, Alabama, and we have cats, dogs, horses, and a few assorted wild critters that show up, like um, me. <laughs> right. And a turtle. Now there's a turtle. A turtle Albert's here now. Yeah. Um, so you're originally from Mississippi? I'm from Loosedown, Mississippi. Yes, a, a small town. And you were a journalist? I was. My parents were journalists, and I got my bachelor's degree in journalism at Southern Miss and worked as a journalist for a decade. Did you, were you writing, did you write for Harlequin when you were still working as a journalist? I started writing short fiction then, but it was after I had, um, I wasn't working for the papers. I, I had decided to write full time and starve to death quickly. But that's it what turned out. And um, that's when I went to a, a gathering. Some Harlequin editors were in Mobile and they had a luncheon and aspiring writers could attend. And so I got dressed up and I went. And so I, I got to talk to some editors and they explained what the books were, you know, what they were hoping to find in new books. And they had just started the intrigue line. And I really could not write a straight romance. I just, I couldn't keep the focus. But when they let me kill off some people, I was really happy. And that's when I saw my first intrigue. So you, so from Rome, from writing the romantic thrillers, what was your next, what was your, your, your first book outside of that? In 1994, I uh, published Summer of the Redeemers, which is Southern fiction, Southern fiction. I love that book. Thank and you. it's like, I, I think Southern Gothic. It is Gothic. Ooh, it creeped me out. It was such a subtle, creepy, it snuck up on you and stayed with you. <laughs> I love the legend of Crybaby Creek, which is in Summer of the Redeemers. And it is a coming of age story about a young girl who is horse crazy. And she lives on a red dirt road called Calioka Road, which is actually here in Mobile County. And I just kind of picked it up and moved it 
across the state line for my literary purposes. And um, there is a true, well, a legend about Calioka Road where um, they say that late at night, if you're driving across the bridge, you can hear a baby crying down in the creek. And there are several different versions of the story of the crying baby. One is that it was not wanted, an illegitimate child, and so it was drowned there. But the other version is that during the Civil War, when some Union troops were coming through, a young mother had fled to the creek to hide from the Union troops. And when she was there, the baby started crying and she was trying to quiet it and accidentally suffocated it. Oh. There are several different stories. But one of the funnier ones that involves me is about five years ago, my niece and I decided to go to Calioka Road, Cry Baby Creek, and see if we could hear the baby cry. But they had built a new bridge, and it was a really steep drop down to the creek. Oh, but we were not going to be deterred. We were going to take our phones and photograph spirits. So we finally get down there, scooting and sliding, and then when we come back, I can't get up the steep cliff. I'm too old. So Jennifer gets under my butt and she's pushing me up, up. And finally, we get close enough to the top that she pushes me up just as the car is coming on the bridge. And they almost wrecked. It was so funny because I guess they thought the ghost of the creek had finally come up for them. So, but it was, we had a good time. We always have a good time. Oh, I've heard a bunch of stories. I know you. I know you always have a good time. And so, so summer for the redeemers. And then, did you write touched next? That was the second book on the Dutton contract. And okay. then Judas Crossing. No, like, that came later. came later. Then I did. I started the Sarah Booth books. Okay, so that's what I was going to ask. So, because you also have the uh, Pluto Snitch. Mm-hmm. Series. Yeah. Another series. Trouble the Black Cat Detective. Trouble the Black Cat Detective. And then I've done, you know, some out of like like standalone, like um Fever Moon and Penumbra. Those are those are really crime darker crime novels. So those are your dark crime and then your horror. Mm-hmm. Oh. What are those times? Darkling, the Darkling and the Seeker. I can't even say them without getting chill bumps. <laughs> I told you that you the one of the Seeker that you gave me. I took it home and and put it when I lived oh. in Florida and put it put it down. And I had was coming back to read it. I hadn't even touched it. Nothing had touched it, and the cover curled open like it was like somebody had taken it and bent it back. That's so crazy. I'm going to close this door because somebody has a whining, barking dog in my sunroom. I wonder who. Titty baby Mo. Yep. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about your horror writing. Okay. I like to scare people. I really like to scare people. And I've always loved scary shows and movies and my whole family loves them. We're like, you know, going to see The Exorcist was a family outing. That's really so sad. But um, <laughs> home from college and my dad was out of town and I was reading this book that had really scared me. So my mother's bedroom was next to mine and I called out to her mama. Mama, can I come sleep with you? And she's like, aren't you in college? You know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I am, but I'm scared. Come on. And she said, okay, come on. So I went and dove in the bed and the moonlight's coming in through the Venetian blinds and she's laying on her back and she's very still. And I'm like, I'm telling her all about the book. I'm really scared. So I'm talking a whole lot. And <laughs> she's done the answer. She doesn't respond. And I'm like, mama. And she just lays there. And I kind of lean up and I'm like, Mama? And she just lays there. So I leaned up real close and I'm like, Mama. And she goes, Who? You know? 
It scared me so bad. I spent the night in the bathtub with the door locked. And she's like, see, 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 see. I was only messing with you to let me in. And I'm like, oh, no, I am not letting you in. No. <laughs> Yep. So you do get it honest. <laughs> I do get it honest. <laughs> so what do you have? What do you enjoy the most um, in writing? Like what? When when I can when I get so deep in the story that real life dissolves and I'm living the story with the characters. That's what I really enjoy. And it you know it doesn't happen all the time. It, it is one of those special kind of things when, when you're writing and the story and the way that you plotted it out and imagined it all comes together for a scene that you know really, really works. And it, it does everything it's supposed to do. Oh, I love it. Um, do you have... Do you have special beta readers or um, like first readers? I do. I do. They are volunteers and they're very, very helpful. I really appreciate them. And um, I have different ones for different books because some people don't like the scary books and some people don't like the, you know, the humor books. So I try to give them what they really, really like so they can tell me if it works or not. They're not editors, but they're good judges of what works and what doesn't work. And do you, you uh, do you send it to them before the editor or? Generally, generally, to see if it's working. And then I'll send it to the editor. And then do you do another round of readers after the editor or is that it? No, no once the editor, once the editors that I have had, I have been so lucky with and they're true professionals. And so once it's in their hands, I've cleaned it up as much as I can where it, you know, hopefully they can, you know, do their magic on it. Yeah. So you, yeah. And a lot of people think if they have an editor, then they just send it to them like a first draft, but you don't want to do that to your editor. Well, I think it depends on what kind of writer you are. I, I, I frequently have timeline issues when I'm writing. Um, you know, I'll get, because it takes a year to write a book. So there are stops and starts. Life, life intervenes, as my friend Eugene would say. And so you're going hot and strong. And then, you know, there's a sick animal or something that needs to be done. And you get knocked off that forward moving path of the, of the novel. And then you have to, you know, pick it up. And sometimes I don't pick it up as cleanly as I should. So I like to have those things sorted out. My theory on publishing is it's a business. I try to turn in the most professional manuscript I can turn in. It's a business. And, and I think, you know, when you're first, often writers who are first published think that that's the, um, that's the end all and be all of, you know, you're there, but you're only as good as your last book. And that's just, it's a sad truth, but it's true of almost any other job. You're only as good as the last thing that you did. And I find that to be uh, a little scary and also a good instruction for doing the best you can with each book. My job is to make my editor's life as easy as I can because they have a lot of authors and you know when you're when you do a sloppy job or you I mean now if you get confused and get in a jam they're happy to help you don't get me wrong but just I try to to be the most professional writer I can be and as having been a journalist uh, there's a level of um you don't get to be a prissy pot you know, you're a working journalist, you have an editor, they work every day, they clean up your stuff, you don't whine, you don't complain, you make it better the next time. I like that. So um, that's really good advice to a lot of new authors. And 
let's talk about agents because a lot of authors would like to know if they need one. You know, it's so funny. You hear people going back and forth and, you know, some people are like, well, why would I have an agent? You want to tell them why? <laughs> well, I've had the same agent for 30 years. And um, her name is Marion Young. She is a terrific agent and a very ethical professional. Uh, she reads the contracts. She understands the language of the contracts. And she keeps me out of trouble. Because, you know, things sound great to me because I don't know. But then she's like, mm, you know, let me see if I can get a, a better deal on that. So she negotiates with the publishers to get me the best deal she can get me. It's not just she reads the contracts and says, sign them or don't sign them. She puts in a whole lot of work and effort trying to get, you know, like foreign rights or, you know, audio rights or whatever that we can have that benefit us. Yeah. And it's, it's, I just, I can't imagine signing a contract without an agent going over it. She also sells the books. She has the contacts in the publishing world where she, you know, she can call up an editor at Dutton or Random House or St. Martin's and say, I have this manuscript. I think you might be really interested in it. I think it fits here. And so she'll find the right person to send it to. Because the publishing houses are huge. Some of them have many, many imprints. Yeah, that's enough. I wanted to ask you, that was another question I had. How many different publishers have you published with? Let's see. Well, first of all, Harlequin, which is a major publisher. Um, Dutton. St. Martin's. Random House. Leisure. Mm, River City, Pegasus. So I've published with, with some medium and smaller presses, which I've loved working with, and some of the larger ones. And I'm also indie published. I write books for me, just books that I want to write. And so I do get them edited professionally. <laughs> <laughs> and I pay someone to put a cover on it because I have no talent at all with graphics or images. So, yeah, I try to be professional there, too. Yeah. And I love that, that you, how you publish them both. I know a couple of other authors that do that. And it's really interesting to me because they, they like both platforms and they know the pros and cons of both. Um, and they're not choosing money. either or. They no, like doing. I make a lot more money traditionally published than I do as an indie author. But the thing about the indie author is it truly is a labor of love. There is nothing more thrilling than to get a contract for your first book because it's a blank slate. You know, you, you don't have any real lucid expectations. <laughs> you might have some delusions, but <laughs> you don't really know what it is and it's that absolute freedom of just telling your story there's no expectation of what your story is going to turn out to be and then you sell the book and then if you have a second book on that contract then you got to do it again and that is terrifying that's a terrifying thing it is it is lovely to have a three book contract it's also terrifying oh yeah because you have to have you've got to give them that product by that time right uh, because there's no leeway on that is it you need to turn your stuff in on time they have a production they have books scheduled and it is not a good thing to to be late or not turn in your book or turn in a, a book that's not publishable so yeah like you said it's a business it is yeah. a business it is an art and a business and it's, it's tough, but, but think about musicians or actors or anybody who are artists, anybody who is producing creative stuff, they have to deal with the reality of the artistic impulse, but it has to, it has to work with 
how to sell, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you were a teacher, you had several students that went on to publish with big houses. Mm -hmm. Um, That had to feel really good. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to see a talent thrive. I bet your students loved you. (laughs) They thought I was fun. (laughs) And I think they did care. I'm in touch with most of them still because I care about them and I want them to have a wonderful career. And, you know, some of them have had to drop out of writing to hold down a work job or raise a family, but we still talk about writing and they'll get back to it and they're going to do something really great. Uh, Lots of fan mail for Sarah Booth Delaney from Readers. I get a bit, I get a bit and I try to answer each one, you know, and I get, I do get some unfan mail. <laughs> like I <laughs> said that Sarah Booth was a slut, you know, and that she didn't want to read about her and thought, well, don't, don't read about her. Strange. Oh. I think she was going through a bad time. Maybe know? her husband had cheated her on her with somebody that looked like Sarah Booth in her mind. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, crazy. So do they call you, and you have fans that call themselves Zinnians? Is that no, no, no? Zinnia gang. The Zinnia gang. Zinnia gang. I was thinking like parrot heads, like a Jimmy Buffett. So is it? <laughs> I guess they would be Boothians. <laughs> Who are you working on now? Are you working on anything new? Um, a Sarah Booth book called Jaws Bones. And it is, and it's a true fact that a bull shark can live in the Mississippi River. So it's about a bull shark that has gotten up to Greenville and they're shooting a movie in Greenville. And there's a lot of stuff going on, but the shark is in the water. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's, I think it's going to be a fun book and uh, it, it's done. It's the first draft is done. And then I'll work on it some more. And I'm working on the synopsis for the next Sarah Booth book, which is going to be set at the Elvis Impersonators competition in Tupelo, Mississippi. And it's called Tender Bones. Ah, so do you, do you come up with the titles first or? I, I try to get it at the same time. It helps me focus the book if I have a title. If I don't have a title, I know my book's not focused right. So it helps to have a title. And I'm also working on a collaborative thriller with a dear friend of mine named Mandy Haynes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a it's a kind of a different book. It's set in 1970. And it is a thriller. It's Southern. It's set in a small Southern town. And it is, uh, I don't want to give it away. And I don't want to talk too much about it. But I'm really hoping that it is as much fun for readers as it is, as it has been for us to be, to write on. So. Uh, We have had a good time. Yeah, we have. And we've got ideas for how many more? (laughs) (laughs) For four more. (laughs) Because we're crazy. (laughs) We're crazy. But, you know, it's fun. I've never done a collaborative book. And this was not anything you were I planned. It just happened. And, you know, and instead of like talking it to death or or not doing it, we sat down and started doing it. And so we'll see. We'll see what happens with it. Yeah, I'm excited. No matter what happens, no matter what happens with it. We're having a good time. And we got a good story. Yes, we do. It's a killer story. Ha ha. In more ways than one. <laughs> um, and I know I'm so lucky. I mean, gosh, to be working with you because you're teaching me a lot. I've never I haven't finished a novel yet. You know, I write short stories and I've never written a literary thriller. Well, you're a fine writer and it's just a matter of learning. Different pacing, different a, a stretched plot P- the plot and the structure are the hardest thing for any writer and so we're learning we're learning how to do this together and so I'm learning too it'll be oh. it's I'm having a good time and I uh, whatever happens we've had a lot of laughs out of it and we've only got one chapter written 
we have the synopsis. Now that's a booger. The synopsis that, is a booger. So that, is true. that yeah, that synopsis was a that was a that was a lot of work. Um and so you know, I haven't so so some people know that I've moved out here. Yeah. To Good Fortune Farm Refuge. So we're neighbors. You're a <laughs> simian now. <laughs> And so me and my three dogs and turtle, we are still that my house is for sale in Florida. So we're not, we don't have all of our stuff yet. So it's a little, a little crazy, but the dogs love it. Um, and the cats are tolerating them. <laughs> they're, my dogs are not, they're learning. Well, they're terriers, better known as terrorists. So, <laughs> and that is true. They are terriers and, and they're, they haven't been around a lot of cats. But they, they're doing good with the horses and so far good with the cats. Yeah, so, so we'll make it. So earlier you mentioned your good friend, Eugene, um, who was a great writer, but he was also, there's a painting behind you. Yeah. The mother-in-law. <laughs> Eugene was very involved in theater, translations. He worked with Fellini and was in some of his films. He, he just, he did everything. And he was Mobile native and he had moved back to Mobile. And his claim to fame, he said, was that he had never worn a pair of blue jeans and he never learned to drive a car. So he would call me and various friends to haul the carcass. If he wanted to go somewhere, if he wanted to go to lunch or whatever he wanted, go to the liquor store, he'd call us to carry him. And oh. it was just so much fun. He um he he had a he had a different life. His parents he he was raised by his grandmother, and he was also um he worked in in the bookstop bookstore downtown, and the Delshamps family took an interest in him and helped him some, and he went he just yeah. became a writer. But Eugene was always driven by his own view of the world. He joined the army. He was a cryptologist. He ended up in Paris and helped found the Paris Review. He were, you know, he knew Hemingway and um, all those Paris, the, wow. the, yeah, all of those writers. And then he went to Italy where he stayed for a number of years and worked with Fellini. He painted caskets. He was a fabulous gardener and cook. He did a cookbook for the Time Life series of Southern Cooking. Um, and he's done numerous other cookbooks, like really funny ones, like recipes from Termite Hall and different things. <laughs> it was just fun. And I'll tell you, and this is a little test that I'll often ask people. And I'm gonna ask you now. Okay. What's the first word that comes to mind to describe your childhood? Feral. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it is proven true since you're a feral thing on the farm. <laughs> but, but my theory is that one word kind of sums up the emotional circle of your life and how we create sometimes what we feel. And so my word was responsibility. That's the first thing I thought of. And I've, I have always had a lot of responsibility. And now, you know, I have all these animals and thank goodness some help, but um, I'm a very responsible person. I take things too seriously sometimes, but I asked Eugene this question and his answer was enchanted. Oh, he could make any moment enchanted. He didn't have money. He was often, you know, at the mercy of strangers, you know. And so, but I would go over to his house to do something and talk to him and just talk about writing. And, and we would toast marshmallows over a candelabra and, and drink a little a little sip of champagne, just, 
an enchanted evening. Ah. And he could do that just like that. And he used to say, fun is worth any amount of preparation. I love that. He was a fabulous human being. Well, how did y'all meet? How did you and Eugene meet? We met at a party on Old Bayfront Road, and he was a guest, and he showed up at the door with a box full of hot dogs from the Dewdrop Inn that he had brought as his contribution to the party. And he was just such a great storyteller and character. And Lord, you'd take him into a restaurant. <laughs> he, he hated pepper shakers. He refused to allow them to stay on the table if he was. He was a gourmet cook. He grew his own herbs. He hated that. And he would bark like a dog in the restaurant <laughs> and demand that they take the pepper off the table and bring a pepper mill. It had to be ground pepper. He had very few rigid standards, but that pepper was one of them. I love that. Okay, so the same person who was a gourmet chef, cook, who that brought a box of hot dogs from the Dew Drop into a party. I love it. The Dew Drop hot dogs are world famous. They are. Oh. They're the best hot dogs anywhere. I don't eat hot dogs, but according to hot dog eaters. Ah, where is, is Dew Drop in still around? Here in Mobile. Well, I'll take you to lunch one day. Because I, I do eat hot dogs. <laughs> Well, you can test them. We can have a taste test. <laughs> and it was oh. never a party unless there was chicken salad. Well, you make good chicken salad. <laughs> Gosh, okay. So, by Eugene. <laughs> uh, oh, and so that's right. When you, so you just, you were, you didn't MC, but you, did you an, announce the, I was the, at the most recent Alabama Writers Forum, uh, Alabama Writers Hall of Fame in Tuscaloosa. I was, a, I won, I was honored, I should say, uh, three years ago, and then they haven't had it since COVID. And Eugene was posthumously uh, installed into the Hall of Fame this past, this year. And I was the MC for the ceremony. So the MC for the ceremony and you rode with friends that knew Eugene. Oh yeah. And, and y'all, and they made chicken salad. Chicken salad and pimento cheese sandwiches, two staples of Southern parties. Oh, I love it. Gosh, you've got so many good stories. I was going to try to stick to writing story, you know, cause so many, you know, readers love them and so many writers love them. And if we start talking about all your fun stories, we'll be on here for way too long. You got to be the horses. <laughs> eventually, eventually, or they'll come in the house, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, yesterday we were repairing gates. We did. We're doing it's farm fun. work yesterday. It was fun. Man, um, drill that really works. <laughs> I'm <laughs> thrilled because <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not very good with with tools. So I'm, I'm the heavy lifter. Mandy's the precision <laughs> person. Thank you, Carolyn, for, for being the featured author for April. And gosh, we covered a lot, but y'all, we had to stop between in between with dogs barking, which you won't know because it'll be edited out, but <laughs> I don't know what I've asked Carolyn and what I wanted to ask her uh, with all the crazy interruptions. But um We'll have her back because we've got lots of other things to talk about. So thanks, Carolyn, thanks for everything. So Bye-bye, everybody.